Welcome to this installment of the Consultants Training Institute's Emerging Leaders Series. I'm Brian Jones with the amazing Brie Guevara with us. Um, Brie has been an instructor within the NACVA CTI, primarily in our Fraud Risk Management Program. Um, we're excited to have you with us. It's good to, to be here, Brian. To spend some time with you about your incredible career. Um, been following you over the past couple of years and I have to say quite proud and impressed with the accomplishments that you've achieved throughout these past what, decade or so since we've, we've known you. It has been a little while and I have to say I owe a lot of that to some of the early experiences I had with uh, some of the ex-Deloitte partners and subsequent CCA folks that sure. brought me to NACBA in sure. the first place. Sure. Never since then it's been a wild ride. Well tell us first of all um, where you went to school, what you studied, and how did you find your way into the profession of of fraud and and valuation and forensics. Right. So the school is the University of Michigan, which uh, I will always have a special place in my heart for sure. in Ann Arbor. And uh, if for no other reason, because some family now, a, a cousin in the form of John Runyon, was accepted to play football there oh. as a legacy since his father also played there. Okay. Um, just before my time back in the uh, mid-90s. So he'll be starting, I think, in a year or two since he's still in high school, but I know he's at training camp now. Okay. So. Just another reason to go back to Ann Arbor. Right, nice. So on that note, one of our recent new hires that we were just talking about, Tim Holtz, the project manager, um, is from Grand Rapids, and I believe he went to school there. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so a little Michigan plug for yeah. him and you. Um, so you went to school there? That's right. And uh, so you know, coming out of the Midwest and Midwest school, I looked at a number of options in terms of where to go, and the markets out of the University of Michigan Business School kind of force you to either Chicago, you know, the somewhat local option, if you will, and then uh, New York as, okay. as a, another hub and, and center of activity for it, either the consulting route or the investment banking route. And so I initially went with the consulting route, okay. having, a, having a focus on finance and computer information systems. And the, uh, the, the project work I picked up quickly thereafter was audit related initially, and then also systems implementation related, which to this day, I think, uh, you know, I, I am very appreciative for because it took me overseas to Saudi Arabia first and then a number, a number of other countries in Europe as okay. well early on in the career. So you, did you have that in mind for your career when you went to school or, or how did you get into that path? With the consulting route, I think more than anything, I was looking forward to a little variety. Okay. Um, you know, I definitely wanted to be involved in uh, your more high intense situations that required some amount of urgency and uh, you know a lot of hands-on work rather than um, the 30,000 foot strategic level that may not be as involved with the business that you're working for. Mm -hmm. And so in uh, getting involved with some of the initial clients working for Deloitte & Touche, I uh, linked up with a group that wanted to break away and focus more specifically on, on either the pure play consulting work or on uh, restructuring and forensic accounting pieces. Okay. So what kinds of things are you involved with now? Right, lately I have uh, spent the majority of my uh, corporate world experience, so as a consultant, as interim management in certain situations, and as uh, on deal teams for equity raises or business sales and restructurings as well. And, and so where that brings me now is to a point where um, you know one third of the project pipeline is probably still consulting and the rest is by and large, um, forensic or litigation driven. Okay. And what types of um, forensic and litigation um, engagements are you are you working with? Right. the uh, The mix is pretty varied. on the uh, On the litigation side, commercial disputes are still highly active, uh, primarily on the East Coast, with a, a New York, uh, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania market that uh, you know all comes into the fold. Um, specifically, there are some large labor union uh, contract renegotiation deals uh, that I and my team at PPD Accounting and Consulting have been able to apply some new, um, some new and some classic kind of economic and contract cost out analyses to. Mm -hmm. I can tell that you have testified a lot. You well, have, haven't you? I, I've been involved uh, to a great extent on testimony prep. Okay. Uh, to a great extent on the expert report side, but mm -hmm. not in front of uh, not in front of the judge or the jury. Okay, right. because you're very I can tell just by by talking with you, you're very clear about communicating, and and one of the things that's really important when you're in the litigation world, as you as you would know, um, is that communication. You know, clear, Correct. concise, to the point. 
um, for folks who are, are watching this discussion with you, what, what advice would you give to them about practicing um, in the area where you are? Right. Well, that's, uh, on one hand, it's easy mm -hmm. uh, because everybody hates to do it. Everybody hates to be maybe the person that's in front of, um, you know, an audience, whether it's an audience of one or, uh, you know, something like 11 or 12 other individuals that may be staring at them intently. Um, and so the, the only reason and the only way to actually make it work is to uh, dive in, mm -hmm. you know, no matter how much you kind of shake or tremble at first. Right. You have to give it a shot Just and find it. out what works. And you can certainly do that in a controlled environment before putting yourself out there for professional risk. Right. So over the past year or two, or maybe just a little bit beyond that, you were engaged in a really cool assignment. I know you were in touch with us at headquarters in Salt Lake, um, assisting with a project related to some curriculum, and we had a chance to touch in on, on, on a position that you had, um, an intelligence position. Right. Um, can you talk about that, or will you have to kill me? No, we can, we can certainly talk about that. Um, so I've also spent several, a couple of years now working as uh, an intelligence analyst for the Army in military, military intelligence. Okay. And, uh, you know, in that role, the uh, tie-in is much closer and tracks, you know, much, uh, much closer than one would imagine to exactly what we do in the profession, like business advisory or specifically like consulting fraud related investigative work that we might do it's highly framework driven and procedural at the same time so what were can you talk about your role with um, the army and yeah. what kinds of things you were doing with with them well the thing that I, that I love and the thing that keeps me coming back to the fact that there's a, a direct tie-in a transferable skill set if you will mm -hmm. is that it all comes down to on the intelligence side it all comes down to intelligence preparation of the battle space, this IPB concept. Okay. And it's, it's a framework that really only mandates that you do four things. One, you, you define the operational environment. Okay. From there, you describe how the operational environment is going to affect your game plan. Then you evaluate the threat, and then you develop and determine various uh, courses of action the threat okay. might take, so the likely course of action or the most dangerous. Hmm. And this is not unlike what we do when we try to scope and get our arms around a fraud investigation at a multinational corporation with the possibilities somewhat endless in terms of where to focus your time and resources. Mm -hmm. well, there's, was there any special training that you had to go to through to qualify to work with the Army? Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a, uh, a battery of tests. There are a uh, top secret security clearance requirements that I didn't know at the time, but certainly <laughs> do involve uh, a lot of follow-up and a lot okay. of interviews of known associates for the past 10 years, wow. um, including all the time that I spent living overseas okay. and, and traveling overseas. Um, and in addition to that, you, you do have to qualify as, as a soldier on the basic combat training side and then also um, pass and exceed at the intelligence school in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Wow. That had to be an incredible experience. It was. It's something that I definitely wouldn't trade for the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if uh, I looked at that doctrine, everything boils down to um, move, shoot, communicate, medicate, and think. Mm -hmm. and, and like that doctrine, there are extremely reflexive and universal components to the fraud investigation, mm -hmm. wherever you go. So what's one of the most thrilling cases or engagements that you've been involved in um, that's a, maybe a little bit of a leading question because we had a chance to talk before, right. before this um, official talk, but um, I guess that case that illuminated um, quite a lot of issues for real estate and, and, and the whole issue that we just currently are rebounding from right. in the American economy. Well, there are, there are some uh, terrific examples, and the, and the one we talked about, uh, REFCO, was a, a large Chapter 11 financial institution that collapsed almost overnight when you know half a billion dollars that was hidden off of the balance sheet came to light. Um, even since then, since that was in 2006, um, one of the most exciting cases I've been involved in to date has got to be the biggest Ponzi scheme ever, mm -hmm. so in the form of Madoff, which right. I'll talk a little bit about to, uh, tomorrow. Right. In class, and in that case, um, you know many aspects of it are ongoing, but every aspect of that case could teach us about con conducting successful fraud investigations. Sure, sure. So I have a question about fraud risk management. You know, so many companies. It seems like there's this prevalence. Um, we see it all the time that this company's been defrauded, or that company's been stolen from, or you know, Bernie Madoff. You know, 
pulled off the biggest scheme on the American world, world economy, you know. Um, but it doesn't seem like businesses are putting into place or taking seriously, you know, what they can do to protect their businesses from fraud or the occurrence of fraud, to minimize the risk of fraud. What is your thoughts and opinions on that? That's a great question, and the answer is yes and no. Uh, on one hand, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of material coming out, a lot of guidance, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Sarbanes-Oxley going way back, mm -hmm. um, new. Um, regulate rules and regulations that have come out since then, of course, that have tried to uh, make the work that auditors, internal auditors, that management itself can do a little more practical mm -hmm. when it comes to controlling the business and, and particularly looking out for, for fraud and the various types of fraud that can afflict an organization. Um, so on, on one hand, there's a treasure trove of information to reference. On the other hand, um, you know, how people implement that mm -hmm. might be a problem. And I think what it comes down to is, is frankly, they need something that I think is uh, akin to the careless courage of youth. Mm. I don't know if you've heard that, but I read mm. that uh, in a book by Don Winslow. And, and in it, he says that it's a, it's a simultaneous flaw in virtue of the youth or the new practitioner to do away with tradition to some extent, do away with established doctrine, and, uh, and leave a little space for original thinking. Mm. So. You know, that's what we, the experienced group here, might, uh, might need to think about a little bit more so mm. that we can, we can be effective. What would be your advice to someone who's looking to get into the forensics and fraud arena? All right. I, I think more than anything, they need a good mentor. They need a, a company they, they can feel they attach to and, and they belong with from a cultural standpoint, but they have to find someone, whether it's a small company or a large company, that they can look up to and learn from. I've, I've been fortunate to have uh, had several wonderful mentors in my past and currently in the form of Joseph Petroselli, oh. who has um, just been a, a beast and a, and a gorilla in terms of his approach to, sure. um, you know, the way he, he, he works specifically and knows the doctrine and the material, but also the way he leaves room for that original thinking. He just authored a book with Wiley, um that's right, detecting fraud. Detecting in fraud, and, and what was really unique about it is mm -hmm. he illustrated that book, uh, I believe, with his son, um, the the fraud gorilla, or he incorporated right. a gorilla concept right, into his book. Um, that's good to know. I didn't realize that you had made a connection with Joe. He's yeah, he's definitely a, a champion of fraud um, detection and deterrence, and, and the whole issue of uh, education, not only for the practitioner but the, for the consumer. Right. Right. So if a young uh, practitioner can do something like that, if they can find um, a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of learning, and mm -hmm. just motivation from somebody that's been around the block, then they'll have uh, you know, a greater chance of success. Well, it's kind of a, a, an exciting career to get into because there's the whole intrigue and investigation and obviously the technical you know, and, and, and investigative techniques. But... but um, it, it, it wouldn't say it's the hard and fast calculations um, that most analysts in the profession are doing. It, it involves a little bit of both. What, what would you? It does. It does. The skill sets that are required for a case, for a large case, whether it's Madoff, Refco, um, something Foreign Corrupt Practices Act related, or even smaller, uh, the skill set is going to be varied. You're going to need an aspect of accounting skills, an aspect of technical skills, and, and perhaps something very industry uh, specific mm -hmm. like uh, healthcare or financial institution related. Mm -hmm. So there's really no there's really no bar with a person's background, other than just their level of interest. Mm -hmm. So in your time away from you know tackling the world of fraud. Um, what are some of the things you enjoy doing in your, yeah. in your spare time? Well, uh, I travel as much as possible, and, uh, and I'm counting this trip here to Las Vegas with NACFA as part of that, um, since I'll be able to enjoy it a little bit, I think. Um, but, I hope so. <laughs> but I've, I've also been able to get involved with uh, some um, philanthropic efforts, um, along with the travels, as well as some kind of... Uh, personal CPE, if you will, when it comes to, you know, the, the article writing or just even research for future articles that we might want to be involved mm -hmm. with. Um, any, where are your latest travels taking you? Where's your favorite place to travel? Um, well, I, uh, I've gone back to, to Paris a number of times and, and the southern coast of France with uh, my significant other. And, um, you know, we, we recently 
and I think just in time, um, put put a little lock on the bridge that now the world oh, is right. saying yeah. we shouldn't put locks on. Um, but it was fun, and we took a lot of pictures of it. And uh, and so there's always a, a special place in our hearts for going back to somewhere like that that yeah. we've been many times, and yeah. that you know it's easy to explore and have a good time. Yeah, you have a beautiful little daughter. Yeah, she is quite the traveler too. Yeah. She has Sophia has had a passport since she was three. And uh, I think one of my fondest memories of her as a traveler was, was somewhat, uh, was very innocent from her perspective, but might have sounded odd to uh, a passerby. The, uh, the movie Monte Carlo had just come out with Selena okay. Gomez. Okay. And, and the entire movie, uh, she was watching with her girlfriends, the entire movie she kept referring to the fact that she'd been to this place and she'd been to that place on the screen because we had just taken a trip and okay. uh, all up and down the coast with her and uh, she remembered it pretty well. Wow. So. She likes to ask her friends about places they've been and uh, is always surprised when they don't mention anywhere in Europe. Right. That's, I think, um, as a young person, I'm, my dad was in the Air Force, so you know, I got the opportunity, similarly probably to your daughter, to experience the world at a young age. And you know, it's, it's so good to have that balance of culture and, 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 and uh, just exposure you know, to different places and, and, and people and cultures and, and history. Right. Um, you know, she'll hopefully grow up to be as seasoned and, and rich <laughs> as, as you are. And you're More so, I'm sure. Yeah. More so by, by far. Yeah. Well, Bree, thank you for spending some time with us. Oh, it's a, a pleasure, Brian. What a great and fascinating career that you have. And hopefully someone out there will be inspired to, to follow in these footsteps and, and you know, be a, a fraud purveyor, not a purveyor of fraud, but a, a what, investigator and, and uh, someone to help prevent fraud. Um, but we'll see you at our next installment of the Emerging Leader Series. <laughs>